the environmental movement has developed a single-minded obsession with the supposed effects of carbon dioxide on the global climate. Rather than CO2 gas, however, the technologies that are now being proposed to mitigate this supposed problem might be the real cause of our coming environmental calamity. This is the GRTV Backgrounder on Global Research TV. For decades now, we have been told to be afraid of the long-term effects of man-made carbon dioxide on our climate. Seemingly every day some new storm, drought, warm spell, or cold snap is featured on the news, with government-funded scientists warning us that this is a sign of things to come unless the world reduces its CO2 production. The problem, of course, is that this is a third-rate scientific hoax propagated on the strength of the public's ignorance of the underlying science, or lack thereof. The models and predictions used to scare the public into believing that CO2 is driving climate and will continue to do so in an increasingly dangerous fashion share the distinction of being universally wrong in their predictions of trends over the past 15 years, yet we are still asked to believe in the long-term validity of these same falsified models. As Robinson et al. noted in their 2007 study, Environmental Effects of Increased Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide, published by the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine, predictions of harmful climatic effects due to future increases in hydrocarbon use and minor greenhouse gases like CO2 do not conform to current experimental knowledge. Also in 2007, J. Scott Armstrong, a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania and the author of Long Range Forecasting, a standard textbook on the principles of forecasting, co-authored an audit of the procedures that the IPCC used for its global warming projections, finding that these procedures violated 72 of the 89 relevant principles of scientific forecasting. Last year, the Journal of Geophysical Research Atmospheres published a study showing that the climate prediction models examining periods of less than 30 years on the geographical scale of continents are riddled with inaccuracies. Earlier this year, the UK's Met Office was forced to raise downward their projections for temperature increase over the next four years after a 15-year standstill in global annual temperatures. Ironically, this divergence from the continuous temperature increases that had been predicted by the CO2 alarmists is now being blamed on natural variability, including the cycles of changes in solar activity, which leaked drafts of the IPCC's AR5 report due out next year indicate have been vastly underestimated. Sadly, the fear-mongering hype and misleading predictions on this issue have become so internalized that there is a subsection of the population that is now willing to question whether every conceivable event in the galaxy is the result of man-made CO2, even near-Earth asteroids. Our science guy, Bill Nye, and you know, talk about something else that's falling from the sky, uh, and that is an asteroid. Uh, what, what's coming our way? Is this an effect of, of perhaps global warming, or is this just some no, meteoric no. occasion? Except it's all science, and it is the word meteorology and the word meteor come from the same root. So, uh... That so many are concentrating so much time and attention to the question of carbon dioxide, a trace gas in the atmosphere which itself is only partially man-made, is only to be expected. Scientists, pundits, writers, and businessmen are only responding to the market incentives that are at play. Governments and universities around the world are now sinking billions of dollars a year into grants to fund research related to the supposed CO2 threat, and entire industries such as carbon trading and carbon sequestration are developing in response to this interest. Quite simply, too much money and potential political power is at stake for the threat of global warming to be revealed as a false alarm. One of the most worrying possibilities to arise from this trend, however, is the political legitimization of a concept that, ironically, has the potential to become a real threat to our environment. Geoengineering. What if we really were in a jam, okay, and we wanted to really cool the earth in a hurry? Okay, we didn't want to wait 40, 50 years. Is there another option? Okay, and we explore scientific solutions uh, that come under the rubric of geoengineering, where we limit solar radiation from entering the Earth's atmosphere by having airplanes disperse sulfur into the air. The particles reflect light back out into space, thereby having a cooling effect on the planet. And you can also apparently do this using giant balloons as well. 
whether this idea is right or some other idea is right, I think it's almost certain that we will eventually think of cleverer things to do than just putting sulfur in. That if engineers and scientists really turn their minds to this, it's amazing how we can affect the planet. The one thing about this is it gives us extraordinary leverage. This, this improved science and engineering will, whether we like it or not, give us more and more leverage to affect the planet, to control the planet, to give us weather and climate control, not because we plan it, not because we want it, just because science delivers it to us bit by bit. The practice of geoengineering is now well over half a century old. As early as the late 1940s, American mathematician John von Neumann was researching weather modification and its potential uses in climatic warfare for the U.S. Department of Defense. In the 1950s, Early cloud-bursting experiments were performed by Wilhelm Reich, and in 1956, Dr. Walter Russell was writing of the potential for complete weather control. In the 1960s, Dr. Bernard Vonnegut, brother of the famous writer, vastly improved the techniques then in use by employing silver iodide crystals in the cloud seeding mixture. Silver iodide's hygroscopic qualities ensure water particles quickly bond with its crystalline structure. As the recent documentary, Skywatcher, points out, the process of cloud seeding is now so widely and routinely employed that it is having profound effects on our climate. Small cloud seeding aircraft such as bombardier jets and high altitude propeller planes deliver their payloads using silver iodide flares that are ignited by remote control. The flares are typically fixed to the wings of the aircraft and release the silver and salt mixture high into the stratosphere so it slowly drifts down into the moist air below. When the pilots of the cloud seeding aircraft can see ice forming on the wings, they know liquid water is present in the air and there's the potential to create storm clouds. So how many sorties do cloud seeding aircraft fly in order to make it rain or snow? The answer is as many as possible. The more aerosols, the more chance of condensation that makes thick rain clouds. Commercial air traffic helps to facilitate the rain by plowing through the field of silver mist, emitting the superheated steam that freezes into expanding clouds. Shade from the artificial clouds drops the temperature below, decreasing the air pressure and creating a low channel that flows like a river, drawing in the moist air. This can allow some ocean storms to make landfall that might otherwise be repelled by higher onshore pressures. Given that CO2 is not the problem it is made out to be, coupled with the admitted advent of modern weather modification technologies and DoD research programs, it is impossible not to inquire into the possible links between the current push toward geoengineering and the military-industrial complex. Last year, I had the chance to talk to Professor Michelle Chosodovsky of the Center for Research on Globalization about the past, present, and future of weather warfare technology. Well, first of all, I should mention that uh, weather warfare is not something which is recent. It was used during the Vietnam War. Cloud seeding techniques which were intended to block uh, enemy supply lines. But uh, in the course of the 1990s, it has become increasingly sophisticated. And I'm, I'm referring to the development, what is called the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, HARP, uh, which is based in Gakona, Alaska, uh, which uh, is, uh, is, a, is a system of, of high-frequency uh, antennas uh, directed to the, uh, to the outer atmosphere and which then can be used to trigger uh, climatic instability uh, in different parts of the world as well as disrupt communication systems. Uh, we talk about NMOD, Environmental Modification Techniques, for military use. I think what is important to point out is that the United States, as well as Russia, have these capabilities, but particularly the United States uh, in relation to HARP, and uh, they have acknowledged that they intend to use these technologies of weather modification, which can trigger floods, hurricanes, droughts, earthquakes, um, against enemies, namely, in the present context, Syria, Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, okay? Um, and uh, and they, uh, they um, explicitly state 
that these uh, weather modification techniques have both offensive as well as defensive applications and can be used for deterrence purposes. Um, in other words, we are in presence of something which is very diabolical. Uh, I consider this to be the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. Why? Because it can destroy the agricultural system. It can destabilize uh, the, the national ecology, the environment. Uh, it can disrupt communications uh, networks. It can destabilize an entire national economy. And, uh, they, and uh, in the present context of asymmetrical warfare on, and the use of non-conventional uh, weapon systems, uh, which has been proposed, in fact, by the, by the U.S. Uh, administration, I would suspect that weather warfare is part of the agenda. Uh, nobody talks about it. Unfortunately, scientists are absolutely mute on the subject. Uh, climo uh, the meteorologists, uh, I'll say that again, uh, scientists are mute on the subject. Uh, it is not part of the debate on climate change, although it is acknowledged that, uh, that these techniques do disrupt climate. Um, and um, ultimately, the scientific debate on owning the weather, owning the weather for military use. I'm using the terms of the, of the U.S. Air Force. Those are, not, those are not my terms. The U.S. Air Force says we must own the weather. We must own the weather so that we can use the weather in the, for military purposes against enemies um, of, of the United States and the Western world. So that is the background. The potential military benefits to the wartime deployment of weather modification technologies are self-evident. In fact, they are so self-evident that, as Professor Chosodovsky notes, the UN was compelled to introduce a convention in 1977 prohibiting the use of environmental modification technology in warfare. The US ratified that convention in 1980. Other potential benefits to the deployment of this technology suggest themselves in the monetary sphere. So many events in the course of human activity are predicated on short-term weather and long-term climate phenomena that the ability to determine or even influence either could be extremely valuable. Insurance companies, for example, stand to lose billions, and reconstruction-related industries stand to make those same billions every time a strong storm makes landfall in populated areas. So it should not be surprising that a market has evolved for weather derivatives, effectively allowing large financial institutions to make money gambling on the weather. And it should also come as no surprise that this market was largely pioneered by that infamous globalist-connected insider corporation, Enron. Last year I had the chance to talk to researcher Peter Kirby about Enron's involvement in weather derivatives and the vast sums that stand to be made as geoengineering projects continue to be deployed under the threshold of public awareness. So let's let's start talking about some of the, the information that you've uncovered about these programs and some of the people behind them. And let's just start by introducing people to something called Enron Weather, which you bring up in your article about geoengineering for financial gain through derivatives. What was Enron Weather and how and when was it set up? Yes, Enron Weather was a division of Enron. Uh, I'd have to reference my paper for the exact date, but it was uh, it existed for about the last five years of the uh, the Enron fiasco, which ended in around 2001. And Enron Weather was the particular division within within Enron that was known to buy and sell weather derivatives. Uh, not only uh, was Enron a player in the weather derivatives market, they originated the weather derivatives market. It, it came out of Enron. It was one of their little, uh, you know, uh, experiments that, uh, that uh, was, uh, you know, came out. And uh, it, 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 at first, it didn't make, make much money for them. Uh, it was an experiment, as, you know, all experimental businesses are. They often need, uh, you know, capital and, and stuff like that to, to get off the ground and take on money at first. But then by the time uh, of Enron's collapse, they were, they were making money by Enron weather. 
it was a money-making department. So people try to downplay the importance of uh, Enron, where they say, oh, well, it was a tiny part and it only lost money. No, actually, by, by the time Enron went under, it was a significant part of Enron. Even if we were to assume that weather modification technologies are not currently being used for the purpose of weather warfare or market manipulation, the potential for such abuses alone should be more than enough to dissuade us from pursuing these technologies. Even more worrying, perhaps, are the true unknown environmental ramifications of the long-term effects of these technologies on our environment. Ironically enough, those who are warning us of the potentially disastrous consequences of man-made climate change may be exactly right in their assessment after all. But in the end, it may not be the man-made CO2 they are worried about that is the real culprit of this coming catastrophe, but the geoengineering technologies that are being proposed as the solution to this problem. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.